really what's driven me. Um, I mean, it's been such an incredible career, just breeding out all your accomplishments. Um, and now you are with both San Benito County and Santa Cruz County, you have multiple roles. And in the middle of this pandemic, it's been, uh, I think, an added, um, you know, you're, you're doing a lot more than you once were, I think, uh, in terms of a public health official. So how, how have you been juggling these roles and responsibilities? Yeah, that's interesting. I, I didn't actually seek these roles out. Um, you know, I, of course, had a presence in both counties as uh, the EMS medical director, managing all the EMTs and paramedics and working with the hospitals. Uh, but, you know, uh, early on, about a year ago, um, Dr. Newell, our health officer here in Santa Cruz County, um, realized that she needed some help. And I was there and I was willing to help. And I've been honored to be asked to do so. And uh, just been an amazing team here in Santa Cruz and also in San Benito County to work with. So uh, I sort of jumped in head first because of this virus, to be honest. Um, you know, in the past, I would fill in, uh, you know, cover for vacations, but I was really the substitute teacher, if you will. And uh, now I feel like uh, I've been really integrated into both teams. In San Benito County, unfortunately, it's a story that you've probably heard elsewhere. Um, the health officer that was working in that county resigned because of pressure from, uh, from the community and um, just the, those kinds of things that are going on. And so I reluctantly agreed to take on that role as well. <laughs> you know, I, I told him I had a, uh, 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 you know, an end date of September 31st. And that was my big mistake because there is no September 31st. So I'm still on <laughs> and we'll continue to do so, but we, um, we're getting more help there. And, and it's been uh, just very fulfilling uh, thing to do. Both counties have similar challenges, but they're also very different. And so uh, having the two to kind of contrast each other has been interesting. Um, and um, I've learned quite a bit. Maybe you should tell them your next end date is February 31st. <laughs> yeah, there you go, February 31st. I'm sure they're very happy to have you though. <laughs> so actually that kind of segues into my next question, which was going to be, you've probably had to make a lot of tough choices during the pandemic. Um, have you struggled with any of them and which ones? Uh, yeah, I don't know where to start, but I'll, I'll try to be brief. But this, this pandemic has been, I call it a series of scarcities. You know, it started off uh, a year ago. Uh, you know, I remember getting calls from the emergency department and they would present a case to me. And I said, well, that kind of sounds like COVID. And I would have to authorize each and every single test. And we were doing about 10 a week uh, because we had to send all of our tests, um, all of our tests over to Santa Clara County because they were running them through their public health lab. And uh, it was just, uh, you know, both Dr. Newell and myself were, were up all night answering these calls and trying to sort of ration tests, if you can imagine. And then, uh, and then shortly after that, it was PPE, and we didn't have enough of that. And then there was, um, um, and then testing sort of continued to be a scarcity as, as we're going on. And now, of course, we're, we're looking at the scarcity of vaccines. And so the toughest choices have been how do I allocate limited resources to whom? And uh, what is gonna do the best good? And, and it, we've had some really interesting, um, uh, you know, varying guidance from both the federal and state level, of course, on this, but also just some uh, in interesting and creative pitches made to us about why uh, certain groups might feel they qualify and, and all laudable. And I, I, uh, I just love that people are interested in getting, getting vaccinated because that's really our pathway out of this is, is a vaccine. Um, uh, I, could, I could digress and talk about how uh, we failed as a country and why we have to rely on vaccines completely, but I think that's a whole nother topic. But, um, but the point is, is that uh, we're, right now our goal uh, in the health department is um, to um, prevent as much um, death and serious illness as we can. So we've been focusing on course, our older folks, but the other uh, key focus here is on our communities that have been hardest hit. And you've seen the numbers, I'm sure, um, mostly, in, at least in Santa Cruz County, it's the South County, uh, it's our Latino population, it's people that um, ordinarily have limited access to health care, uh, people who can't work from home on Zoom, who are out there doing our services, who are working in our nursing homes, who um, really have no choice but to be exposed in their place of work. 
and who are um, being most affected. Uh, on top of that, uh, many have underlying conditions that aren't as well managed as we would like them to be. So uh, we're, we're continuing to really focus on those groups and, and hoping to reach out to them. But um, it's been a real challenge from that perspective. Absolutely, I can't, I can't even imagine. Um, you know, we're, we're now starting to come down from just what was an incredible surge in cases. Um, it was a really, really bad situation for about three months there from yeah. mid-November through about early February. Um, there were several weeks in there where, you know, the hospital capacity was really uh, concerning. I mean, on there were, I think, back-to-back -back probably three weeks where we saw every day zero beds available in the ICU and things like that. So yeah, yeah. Um, were you worried about Santa Cruz County's hospitals availability? And what did you have a plan in place in case it got out of hand? What were you seeing on the public health officials end? Yeah, yeah it, great question, um, Tulsi. I, the last couple of months have been really, really tough because um, because it was becoming very clear that we did not have enough health care to go around for people that needed it. And we were very close, I mean, very close. Uh, and talking with each of our hospitals, with the intensive care physicians at both hospitals, the ethicists, um, we were very close to having to decide who was gonna get care and who wasn't gonna get care. And to me, that's just absolutely amazing in the United States that we were there. Um, you know, I've seen it uh, in, um, yeah, in Haiti and volunteer work that I've done there. I see what broken healthcare systems are. I did not expect to see that here in the United States. I mean, of course, we've had, you know, plane crashes and various disasters, short term kind of um, scarcity of care, but to have a long term thing like this was just completely unprecedented. And so, uh, uh, when the numbers started to come down, I think we all had a big sigh of relief. Um, but for we were we were very close to implementing what we call crisis care standards, which was was, you know, um, having a, a third party uh, panel uh, uh, or um, you know group of experts take a look at clinical clinical criteria, and then having to tell doctors, no, I'm sorry, we can't provide that resource to this person because you know, their prognosis is not as good as maybe somebody else and uh, just a horrible situation. So uh, I, um, I was very afraid. I was looking at some of the models looking out into March and April and it looked like we were gonna have um, a peak that was probably double or even triple what we just went through. And that really depends on the variance and so forth. But uh, now the modeling is starting to look a lot better. But one of the most interesting things about this model that I wanna share with you is that um, the model uh, puts in different factors like, um, you know, vaccines, about variants, but also about masks. And you know, the most effective measure to prevent um, overloading our hospitals, to prevent spread, are masks. And it's low tech, it's cheap, it's easy, but for some reason it's become this political uh, pressure point. Uh, I don't understand it. Um, but uh, I think it really sort of exemplifies why uh, we've had such a trouble, such trouble in this country dealing with this. So Dr. Ghilarducci, we do have to wrap up so we can move on to the next panelist. But I do, since you brought up the March surge, I wanna ask you really quickly, um, are the models looking any better? Yeah, they are looking better. And I can't explain why, uh, because just two weeks ago, they looked pretty bad. But um, I think it has to do with vaccine rollout is making a big difference. You know, we've, we've vaccinated over 70% of our uh, elderly uh, population in this county. That's going to take a lot of pressure off of our hospitals. So, um, so I'm hopeful. I, I really feel a lot better now than I did two weeks ago. Well, that's great. Um, thank you for giving yes. us that, that update. And we will come back to you in a little bit. Uh, Mark, take it away. There will be more for Dr. G. Absolutely. Jenna Lee. You are up next. Wow. And uh, I will start by saying as of, uh, I think the number since the pandemic began of downtown businesses that have ceased operation is now pushing well over 30. I think we had 
we had listed 29 and that was in January. Um, it's gotta be, it's, it's probably more than 30 now. And here you are deciding to, let's open another business. Let's expand. Yeah. Are, you, are you, are you nuts? What, what's going on here? I mean, probably maybe a little bit. Um, it's one of those things where I'm like, I think that I might be asleep and in a hibernation that I don't know. And I'm just kind of like going on an autopilot right now. But I have to say, I, you know, my heart feels so much for those 30 businesses that have closed. And equally, my heart feels super happy for the new paths that they're going on. But even more, also, all the businesses that have opened, right? We have been seeing a lot of new ones come in. I think you know, maybe there's like somewhere seven to 10, maybe um, downtown new that have opened. And so they're crazy with me too, probably. <laughs> but um, so that feels really exciting, right? Of the, the like myself, where we're finding um, a challenge in this time and a need for a life pivot, a personal pivot, a professional pivot, and turning it into an evolution, right? So I chose with Yoso that instead of taking a complete pivot per se, because a pivot to me is something isn't working and you have to change altogether. And I know what we do works, but the pandemic is putting a kink in that hose. And so instead of completely changing everything, I thought, well, let's evolve. How can we be for, there for our community even further? And this is where you insert like, crazy generally and opening another business in the height of a pandemic when who knows that could get closed too right but I went out on a limb and I took a chance and I just believed that what's going to happen is going to happen but at least I'll have now a new online web website right that you can also support that wellness going home and if the retail shop gets closed then we're just going to keep doing our best through it and coming up with solutions and that. So, yeah, I don't know. You call me crazy or just, yeah. Yeah. Well, it, and you, you kind of diversified, right? I mean, and that's, yeah. <clears throat> that's key to sort of wanting to, to operate in this sort of environment. And, and, you know, I think as we spoke about earlier, it shows you sort of validated your purpose and your mission. If you're willing to make that sort of commitment in this kind of moment, then I guess you're all in and, and you're in the right, you know, you're doing the right thing. So Talk a little bit about the roller coaster ride, though, of like PPP and special special COVID safety supplies, and having to lay off, and then trying to bring back staff, and putting money into ventilation systems. And you know, I know you had a an, an outdoor setup at at the Paradox Hotel, all ready to go before before the CZU fires decided to sort of rain down on that parade. I mean, it's it's got to just be you got to be sort of exhausted by this whole process. Yeah, so my plan is in 2022 to go on like a serious vacation somewhere out of the country and just lay on the beach. Um, but I'm going to be patient for that. And right now, yeah, I'm, I, I do feel tired. And yet I also have this wild adrenaline because I am. So we have only been open now a total. We're coming up on a year of this all beginning where the closures happened really for us it started for us actually this past week right around valentine's day this last year um and so we're kind of at our year when we started seeing a shift happen with our business and then we got closed right and so we've actually only been open for 18 weeks out of the last year which is really hard and um we've been closed for we've essentially closed four times and so with that, yeah, I have to do the layoffs. I've had to lay off staff every single time because I can't afford to have 12 people on staff that how we generate income is by putting our hands on people, by touching them and creating that connection. And if we can't even be, have our doors open to do that, I don't have money to pay. So then I, you know, you get the PPP, but even with that, because my business is closed, I need to be responsible and careful how and when I distribute that. Um, and so I did receive that and I've gotten both. I just got the second one. The first one we went through fairly quickly because at that time it was, you have eight weeks to use this. So you're kind of in this panic mode of, well, wait a second, my business is closed. How am I going to use this? I don't want to pay this back. So I'm still working through that forgiveness and hoping that I get forgiven. Um, and now we've got the second one and now my staff just is back for the last two weeks, which is exciting. 
but um, yeah, there's been a lot of the layoffs, a lot of turnover, for example. Well, I'll touch on uh, the one of the closures. We were just about to go outdoors because we were given permission as a personal service, invested in the emotional, mental, physical energy of doing what would be an outdoor spot hotel paradox, going through the insurance process, and all these parts, building out stuff um, was like, getting kind of it started to test out for like a day or so and then had to close because of the fires. And so we've gotten hit. And at that point we couldn't do anything. We couldn't even offer service. We weren't allowed indoors and we could definitely couldn't do skincare, massage services outdoors um, with the smoke. It was not safe. We weren't just, we just weren't gonna take a chance. When it was safe, insurance wouldn't allow us outdoors. So we really got, have been hit in many ways. Um, you know, and, and to touch on your question about COVID with how as a business we have to uh, evolve, modify, make shifts to function and be open, right? And so for us, we, we definitely, we temperature check everybody that comes in. They have a COVID screening form prior to coming. Um, but we've also happily, because it's important, but invested a lot into making sure that while we were already doing the steps necessary to keep a safe, clean, sanitary environment, we really upped it a whole nother level with COVID. Um, we already had things like hand sanitizers in the room just because it was important to have and um, all of the medical grade disinfectants that we use because we have to quax and sanitize and disinfect our supplies and implements. And so we were doing a lot of that, but we really amplified that we invested I invested a few thousand dollars into the air filter purifiers, um, just so many different parts, right, that go into it. And that doesn't, you don't recoup that as a business and a spa that is closed. And so it's a challenge. It's a challenge to have a business, a personal service in this industry. And it's not over for us. We're not, it, no. we're open, but we're not where we once were yet. Well, now that you've, so you've been two or three weeks back in and, and, you know, the, as, as, uh, as Dr. G told us, it's, it's looking, you know, it's looking better and better, you know, and, and I think as we talked about earlier, if, if things stay open, I mean, have you had a sense the last couple of weeks that maybe we could get on more of an, a normal trajectory here and, and sort of you know, sort of recoup where you, where you wanted to be at this point pre-pandemic. Yeah, I do think so. I think what's, what's happening for us is we are seeing a lot of new clients in. Right now, a lot of our past clients who we had before the pandemic, they were of an age group demographic that was not, um, like they were a little bit older maybe and were wanting to wait for the safety and the security of what was happening with this pandemic. So a lot of our previous clients or who had autoimmune diseases, cancer, like a lot of different conditions that would create that instability for the security of coming to the spa or really not just the spa to go out, right? Um, so they haven't fully come back yet. So we've had a lot of new clients coming in since we've been open, which has been really exciting to see. And what I'm seeing from that is people are realizing the necessity, the essential need for their that self-love, self-nurturing, self-care and wellness than they've potentially ever recognized before and even taking that home with them. And so I do think that this trajectory is, if we're going to be going in another wave of wellness, I think it's going to become more, our approach and mission and vision at Yoso has always been that we are not a food food pampering spa. We are here as part of your lifestyle to create that health and that shift in a holistic way, but to truly be part of that lifestyle and that health for you, because our mental health, our self-care, all of it impacts our, our bodies, our mindset, our skin, everything. And so I truly believe that we are going to go into this phase where people are acknowledging and recognizing that need even more. And because I'm seeing that, I'm seeing new, so many new people come in and, and what they share with us. And as the vaccines roll out more, as um, more information comes with COVID, I think we're gonna start to see our past clients coming in too. And so I do really see something beautifully positive happening. And I'm really excited about it. That's great, that's great. Well, thanks for sharing, Jenna. We will, uh, we'll, we'll get to some more of it on the, on the panel discussion. And um, Pulsi, I believe has got uh, Daisy Nunez. Yes, thank you so much, Jenna Lee, for sharing your story. 
Um, Daisy, welcome. Just to remind everyone in the audience, Daisy is with uh, PVUSD. She's a guidance, I'm sorry, she's a counselor with Watsonville High, um, among several other hats that she wears. Um, so Daisy, how's your job changed this year? How has it been reaching teenage students uh, virtually and counseling them? Good evening. Thank you, Jenna Lee, for sharing your story and uh, Dr. G. It is an honor to be with all of you today. So my job has changed um, completely. Uh, we left our offices, classrooms, hoping we would be back in a week and we're coming close to a year. So we were used to doing writing services in person, especially uh, serving as a socio-emotional counselor and now transitioning into academic counseling. And so we just had to get creative. So we created virtual offices where we have placed all of our resources for students. We have adopted new technology platforms to communicate with students, such as Remind. We email them uh, almost daily. <laughs> we utilize the, our Google Classrooms. Uh, we have even tapped into ways to connect with students through social media like TikTok. And so just really expanded what the, the, the work that we do with technology and it has allowed us to grow and to see the different possibilities. And um, it's been challenging adjusting to remote learning and having a school closure. Uh, but nonetheless, there's been I would say what great moments in which I remember one day we had a parent evening and it was raining. It was raining so much. And my colleagues and I talked about how had we had that meeting in person, we probably would have had a smaller turnout of parents, but because it was virtual, we had over 150 parents attend. So that was wonderful to see that when we go back, we will do a hybrid of you know, taking into consideration that people uh, are now used to Zoom or Google Meets and how can we uh, maximize the information that we share with families by embracing technology. Well, I think you provided a perfect segue because my next question was going to be what, um, what support resources or what advice would you give parents who have kids at home right now and could be struggling either with distance learning or being, um, you know, separated from their friends and their peers and being stuck at home all the time. Um, as a counselor, what do you tell your parents? Well, we are all wired for connection and school closures have um, created a, a barrier, right? And so what I would recommend for parents is to establish healthy self-care routines, because while well, motivation can be, you know, come and go, having those routines in place provide predict predictability. And so when, you know, looking at their schedules, uh, recognizing that the importance of self-care, such as going on walks, uh, connecting with friends, having that, that whether it's through Zoom or, um, you know, FaceTime, whatever social media that they use, it's important to incorporate that connection because we are wired for connection. And it, and I have also experienced Zoom fatigue or, you know, screen fatigue. And so I'm, I'm big on wellness through walking. And Dr. G talked about how we wearing our masks can be so helpful. So I, I am big on walking and talking. And I would encourage families to walk and talk and to connect with nature. So developing healthy routines and checking in with your student uh, and walking and talking, wellness through walking. Wonderful. Um, so have you been seeing any concerning um, trends with students this year? Um, you know, we know that Watsonville has been one of the worst affected places in Santa Cruz County. Um, and it can't, you know, your students, students don't live in a bubble. I'm sure they are impacted daily. Um, 
by the pandemic. Are you seeing anything that's concerning? Access to mental health services. There is a lot of need and unfortunately not enough resources. Uh, access to technology, uh, inequities. Yeah. And it's, I think, you know, providing events such as this one gives us the opportunity to share our self-care routines, to, to be able to provide that hope mm -hmm. and rec by recognizing that now is not forever. And I would say, you know, do I have some concerns around when we come back? Yes. <laughs> uh, there's, if, I, earlier we were talking about just being a teenager is challenging. And now when we add a pandemic and not being able to connect when we're wired for connection, there's greater challenges. Uh, but I am hopeful that we will get through it because I have been a witness to the resilience of my students. And every day I'm reminded of what can be achieved when we foster that hope and we empower them to believe in themselves. That's really wonderful. I'm sure your students are lucky to have you. Um, so I, I'm going to change track a little bit. And firstly, um, this is something that I checked with Daisy about before I bring this up, just so everybody knows I checked with Daisy. Um, she has personally suffered unimaginable loss um, in the past year. Um, she has lost five friends and family to COVID-19 and um, she's had a total of 12 people in her circle, um, her, 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 her wider circle who have passed away in the past year. And um, this is something that most people don't experience. Um, and yet, uh, you know, she, she works every day in mental health and she calls herself a hopeologist um, for her students. And um, how, do you, how do you keep that hope alive? And, and let me just say, I'm so incredibly sorry for your loss. Thank you, Tulsi. I just wanna take a moment to recognize the collective losses that we've all had and, um, and just honor them for a second. <sighs> Thank you. Um, I would say that I consider myself a hopologist because hope is reflected in everything that I do. And that is just how I live my life. I recognize that there's challenges and there's things that I, adversity that I'm presented with that I have no control over. And I, I, I come back to my agency, what do I have control over? And that includes my attitude, my perspective, my ability to reframe and recognizing that the moment that, I, the way that I feel now is not forever. So I, I, I wake up, you know, with um, the support of my husband, we go on these daily walks. I, as I connect with nature, I recognize all my blessings. I make it a daily practice to pray. And I think I'm, I'm a Catholic um, believer that, that I know that um, God is going to, is supporting us and will get us through this process. So for me, uh, when I think about just the blessings that I have, the blessing of this job to be able to support students during a pandemic, and for me, helping is healing. And every opportunity that I am able to connect with a student that is experiencing a challenge, I we walk this journey together and I hold that space for us by recognizing that I can't take away the pain. And so how I think about how can I teach the student to still find those pockets of hope and learn to live with the pain by holding on to the hope that there will be a better tomorrow. Well, thank you so much for sharing your strength. And once again, I'm so sorry. And I'm, I'm really glad those students have you. Thank you. Mark, go ahead. Indeed, indeed, yeah. Boy, well, DNA. Yeah. You're a comedian, but uh, you know, in order to segue out of that, I mean, we, we know that behind comedy is there 
lies a lot of, you know, a lot of serious, serious stuff. And you are, uh, you know, you are a man feeling both sides of that right now. You're, you're rooted in, in, in a livelihood based on making people laugh and, and that, that shared experience, but you, you can feel some of that, uh, that darker side right now too, can't you? <laughs> well, th thanks for having me here first off. And, um, wow, Daisy, that was amazing. And, you know, what I do is so stupid compared to what you do. And so, you know, it's like laughter is important, but the work with the kids and, and your attitude is so inspiring. And then just, and thank you for sharing that. That was very, very, I felt like crying. I, it, it, yeah, I mean, sure. I, I, yeah, I've had so, I've had so many friends I've lost in the last six months. It's crazy. And, you know, to COVID. And then I've also lost people to uh, QAnon who went down that rabbit hole and they're gone. Um, and, and that is the uh, crux of this pandemic. It's loss. We're all losing so much. I mean, uh, uh, you know, I'm having dreams the, the last couple of days, the first, the last dream before I wake up of seeing an old friend and hugging them it's better than porn. Like it's, I can't wait to hug somebody, you know? I mean, that's such a bit, you know, going out, socializing. I mean, it's, it's quite an experiment we're going through and earth gave everyone a time out. Earth was like, everyone go to your room and think about what you've done, you know? Um, and uh, sure. So, but then, you know, the, the equation is, um tragedy plus time equals comedy you know that's why a lot of people they'll tell a joke about something that happened and people will go that's too soon right, right. We, we haven't processed this enough for you to be making fun of it um <laughs> which goes back to how difficult it is to be a comedian right now because all the arts are suffering like it's not just comedians actors musicians i mean in music, you have, uh, you know, lighting crew, roadies. I mean, it's, it's a huge impact and, um, you know, theater. And so, but when things return and as they return in whatever form they return in, those people will still sing their songs and put on their plays, you know, sports athletes, they'll still play the games, but comedians, you know, what we used to talk about, some of it doesn't work anymore. And like, and how do you address the sorrow and how do you, you know, so yeah, it's a very interesting well, time. Maybe, maybe you just be a little more earnest and, and you have those sort of lighter laughs, right? Can, and I, can I have Tulsi talk to me? <laughs> <laughs> she, she's going to bring it in tears. I'm trying to bring it back to some, you know, levity. No, it's, uh, I'm yeah, what you you were you were doing more than comedy though. You so you know what you had launched with the the comedy lab and had you know sort of poignantly you know celebrating your year anniversary right as this this virus was sort of popping onto the radar. Yeah, and and you you know you were doing you were hosting other events. It wasn't just comedy. You know you were you were having you know other types of speakers and and groups of all kinds because you had created a space right that was something that hadn't existed around here and and you know that was you had to be feeling like you were you were kind of in a good place you know you'd kind of you'd you'd kind of made it in a way in in this place and to see that sort of pulled away right at that time it's got to be a tough uh you know a tough pill to swallow wow is this like one of those reality shows where they're like uh you know and and here's the dad you know you bring in someone to humiliate him um i'm not the i'm not the baby's father um what am i saying yeah sure it sucked it was terrible thanks for bringing that up yeah the, the short the, the in a nutshell i put on free shows all through California, but mostly in Santa Cruz for 14 years. You know, we did a show at the Blue Lagoon every Thursday for 14 years. And because I was in there so much, I don't actually need to get a vaccination uh, because if you've been in that bar enough, you can survive anything. 
Uh, and, you know, as well, and, and, you know, again, as talking about loss is like, you know, we did stuff at the Poet and the Patriot, they're closed. We did stuff at 99 Bottles, they're closed. We did stuff at Ponos, they're closed. We did stuff at Rosie McCann's, they're closed. Um, you know, but before Quar, you know, I was doing all these shows and I started putting on bigger shows like, like citywide festivals where we had, you know, a hundred comedians in a dozen venues over three days. And a, a lot of it was free because I believe laughter should be non-elitist. I think everyone should have access to laughter, um, which is a terrible business model, but that's the way I ran it. And then uh, a guy came up to me. <laughs> I don't want to mention his name. Uh, no, this guy, Mike, Mike Pappas, who his wife owned True Olive Connection downtown, which closed and is now on an online platform. Um, so, you know, generally, you know, kudos to you for keeping going through this uh, pandemic and adapting and mutating and evolving, which is what you have to do, because this is also unprecedented. And Mike had offered me an opportunity to get into a brick and mortar. And I was like, what a great opportunity to have my own comedy club. And we opened up in the old Riverfront Twin movie theater that the Regal that had gone out of business. And the place was falling apart it was terrible and you know we took out a sba bank loan uh more money than i had ever dealt with and we spent at least a hundred thousand dollars on the building to make it safe um so you know whoever moves in there next uh you're welcome <laughs> and um you know i started putting on shows that's what that's my wheelhouse that's what i've always done since i was a child i love putting on shows and we did 288 performances in the first year and like you're saying you know we had you know you know we worked with bookshop santa cruz we built great alliances with cabrillo and ucsc and small uh smaller stakeholders you know uh that we had film festivals and we had free gatherings. It, it was an amazing, it was like a community performing arts center. There was something for everybody. And then on the week of our one year anniversary in 2020, new menu, new chef, man, we just had turned the corner. We lost money every single month that we were open. I didn't take a paycheck. I was working at least 70 hours a week and we were just turning the corner. I had most of 2020 booked, I mean, we were going to be okay. And then uh, we had the biggest weekend we ever had. <laughs> On March 8th, we had uh, our last big show, 320 people came to see the real Irish comedy tour with these six comedians from Ireland that flew in, who then were not <laughs> able to leave the country <laughs> because they shut down all the airports. They're probably still here. Um, and then I had been reading the newspapers and I had been seeing what's happening in China and Italy. And I just knew I've seen the movie contagion. Have you ever seen the movie outbreak? I knew this is my wheelhouse dystopic movies. So I told my business partners, we have to close and we closed first one in the country. It, it, I'm here to bring joy to people or at least make them think, but not to make them sick. And in California, at least, live entertainment inside buildings has been illegal since March of 2020. Um, in other states, you know, Nevada is open. You can go see a show in uh, Vegas or Atlanta or, you know, but not in California, whatever. That's the way it is. So, you know, I've had to, like I was saying to, to um, generally, you got to mutate and evolve. So I've I'm now doing shows outside or on Zoom, and that's what the new thing is, whether you, you like pivoted, it or not. You, you've pivoted quite well. So, you know, it, sadly, it was, it, was, it was Christmas Eve when, you know, you finally said, okay, we're, this is not, we're not opening this building back up, but a lot of exciting things have happened since, and I believe you've even got some exciting stuff percolating right now that you might want to you might want to let out. <laughs> yeah, well, first of all, I just want to, I don't know, how, I got to, I don't know how this is going to work. Let me see if I could just, uh, no, I don't know if I can see, but this is, I don't want everyone to know where I live, <laughs> um, but this, this is a all driver's license. Let's see if I can, hold on, I'm going to have to turn off my, um, you're going to have to see uh, the magic of this room. Um, and then uh, so this is, can you see that? 
there DNA. There I, it I, is. I used to have dreadlocks. And uh, uh, so tell Wallace Bain, he wow. called me out like it's a wrestling show. <laughs> there you go. You Wallace, I want to see your it. ID. You did it, right? But yeah, wow. we're pivoting. We're doing outdoor shows. I'm talking to two breweries about doing uh, comedy shows in their parking lots. See, I don't know why I opened a comedy club. I should have opened a parking lot. <laughs> um, and uh, we do the Zoom shows. Like right after this Zoom show at eight o'clock, we have our Wednesday show. It's comedy and magic uh, and a puppet because uh, I'm a weirdo. And uh, our headliner is this guy, Mike Kaplan, who's been on every single late night show. So it's so strange because no one leaves their home. I'm getting these comedians that, you know, have been on, you know, Jimmy Fallon and they're just looking for people are looking for something to do because it's been a hard evolution for comedians. Just the last short story and I'll get out of here. But like, you know, I started doing the Zoom shows. We were the first comedy club to go virtual. So we started doing Zoom like the first week of the pandemic. And these we have ne no one's we've never done comedy on Zoom, you know. And so I'd have these headliners just have these meltdowns. It was, it was so therapeutic for us. Uh, but it, well, I don't know if it was comedy. And one of the comics, uh, and you should look her up as well as watch my show, uh, DNA's Comedy Lab on Facebook. Um, her name's Carmen Lynch. Everyone here, you should look her up. She's so funny. But we did the show like in April and she was stuck at her boyfriend's house in the Northeast, did the show out of the car, completely depressed, like doesn't know what's going on with her life. The world was upside down as it has been for all of us uh, and not that long ago. And it still is for many. And she pivoted and now she's huge on TikTok. She does like little encapsulations of the Queen's Gambit in like 20 seconds. She's brilliant, so funny. So it's been an interesting ride. Um, and uh, yeah, I appreciate the platform. All about the the pivot and the the creative, uh, you know, creative mind. So thank you, DNA. That was that was great. We'll uh, we'll have some more fun on the the panel here. Uh, but first, we will uh, we'll get back to Tulsi and uh, Rabbi Paula. Yeah. Um, thank you, DNA. And by the way, people uh, are asking in the chat for links to your, your show. So go ahead and drop a, a link in the in the chat if you want to. Um, also, before we uh, get to Rabbi Paula, I just wanted to remind everybody that after uh, we finish talking to uh, the rabbi, we will have a panel discussion and then we'll talk to uh, Dr. Gillard Ducci about um, any questions y'all might have about uh, the vaccine, the variant, um, COVID in general, mask wearing, whatever it is uh, that you would like answered. So put your questions in the Q&A. Um, okay, Rabbi, thank you so much for joining us. Um, you are just really well known in the community. Um, Wallace Bain featured you as part of our 21 for 21 series uh, last year. You know, as um, as as one of the people that will help inspire Santa Cruz in 2021. So you've been really just an active member of the community. Um, but this year was different, um, and I know that activism is really just part of who you are. But you know, um, how 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 was it not being able to really? be an activist the way you were for so many years um, in that traditional sense. Thank you, Tulsi. And first, I just want to say thank you and how honored I am to be here with all of you and to listen to your stories and really feel moved to tears and laughter. So I really appreciate the inspiration and the invitation. Um, yeah, when, when Wallace and I chatted, I talked a lot about how my usual uh, form of activism has been oftentimes to be out in the streets demonstrating and that hasn't been an easy thing to do given the uh, pandemic although we've done a few small things here and there but my community um, our social justice committee has just grown proportionally um, we we wrote like i don't know 7500 postcards mm -hmm. to get people out to vote and then you know to georgia to get people to vote and people are working now on um, all kinds of different projects gun violence prevention, and we are very involved in COPA communities organized for relational power and action. And um, we are we are still engaged in social justice work. For me, my spiritual life is very much connected to that. And it's really a reflection of the community. And I was just thanking some of our leaders this morning for giving me the, the opportunity to spend some of my time 
for me, when I try to teach, it's very much about grounding um, Jewish values in activism. And so, you know, no matter what the holiday is, like we're going to be talking for Passover. Um, one of our members is Doron Pomochero, and he runs Food What? And he's going to be talking about Passover and food justice. So, you know, for me, it's not just about what I do, but it's about helping to bring in the people who can also inspire others in our congregation. And that's very, very important to me that everybody feels like, you know, you're also acting and you're connecting that to your spiritual path. That's what I grew up with. That's the Judaism I had as a kid. And it's what I hope to really, um, and a lot of our young people are very engaged too. We are working on a um, project with a young man who grew up in the congregation, solidarity with the Amamutsun people around some mining proposals that are happening up, uh, you know, up in uh, San Benito County that we're going to help do some solid solidarity work with the Unitarian Universalist Church. And so, yeah, it's been, you know, we're doing what we can do on Zoom, we're writing, we're calling, we're having virtual meetings with our um, elected officials, you know, statewide, we're involved in a statewide effort, and nationally as well. So it is very important. Um, that's really incredible. And along with all of the other things that you're doing, you're also the senior rabbi at, at the temple. <laughs> um, and, you know, you, you have all of these, these duties that you have to perform, but um, how's, how's it been, you know, with, I know with Hanukkah, you did um, on the first day, I think you had an outdoor uh, menorah lighting, um, but, you know, the, the high holidays, even bat, mis, bat mitzvahs, bar mitzvahs, funeral services, yeah. how's that been? It's been, well, there's been a lot of things that have been, I have to say, both a challenge and also opportunities. So um, what DNA, what you were saying about bringing people in from other places, we've been able to have speakers who, you know, we wouldn't necessarily have access to if they had to get here. <laughs> so that's been really important in terms of what our programs have been. We have one volunteer who has been incredible with editing videos. So we're going to re-edit our Passover video. We've been doing some in person. We're doing outdoor bar and bat mitzvahs. I've got one coming up and we've got one this weekend and I've got one coming up in a couple of weeks. The hardest I think have been really the funerals um, because first of all, and unveiling. So in Jewish tradition, a year uh, on the anniversary of the year of a death, um, you go to the cemetery and you unveil the monument, the marker. Um, and last year we had a very tragic um, situation, a number of them, but we're a young, child who was six years old died. Um, and um, we did the unveiling in December. And to not be able to hug the family and have all the, like the grandparents couldn't come because they were out of town. And just the grief, um, like Daisy, you were talking about how you hold that grief and how you try to give people hope. They have two other children in that family, you know, and how you want to just love them. You want to just hug them. Um, so, and then we also have been doing Zoom memorials and Zoom, we say a memorial prayer. I did one last night and the night before for someone who died of COVID down in Los Angeles and the grandson is a member of the congregation. And so there were 75 people on Zoom saying the memorial prayers and sharing stories about the grandfather with his wife there and his daughter there. And, you know, so, and people could come from New York and from Florida. So there's been a way in which we've connected people who wouldn't have normally been able to come to something like that, who have been able to. And I think the other thing, and Daisy, I don't know if you're finding this, but what I've noticed is that there's some ways in which the vulnerability is, is actually more accessible on a screen than in person. Like people sometimes can share more when they're not having to look at the whole person, but just being able to, like someone talked today about for the first time, saying the memorial prayer for a problematic parent. First time in 16 years they wanted to say it. So I don't know that they would have been able to share that if we'd been sitting in a room together. And I think that's something also that we have to acknowledge when you were talking about hope and gratitude, Daisy, I was thinking about that, you know, that there is some access. Every Friday evening, we do now a call for 20 minutes for anybody who wants to say the memorial prayer. People are coming in from Cuba and people are coming in from Connecticut and we're going to keep doing that. Like that's one of the learnings that we've had around the hybrid. I think also this has been an opportunity for people to be paying attention in a different way. You know, we've seen that, whether that it was about the, you know, brutal murder of George Floyd or about the Capitol on January 6th. People are watching now in a different way. 
and um, people are feeling the need to be together, to talk about these things. We're not, I think that's the interesting part is that we're not, we're not turning away from some of these things because we have the time. I'm not getting in the car, I'm watching the New York, I'm reading the New York Times. You know, I'm not driving to the office, I'm reading the New York Times in the morning. So there's a lot of um, ways in which I think, you know, the connection between social justice and spiritual life. I have found there have been a lot more people who've needed connection and being part of a community has been very important. So um, one last question, and we can unfortunately keep it very quick because we're kind of running behind a little bit. Um, have you seen people turning to faith um, during this time? Um, you know, a lot of churches um, and church leaders I've talked to have said they're seeing a dip in, in attendance just because of not being able to attend in person and then not having the access to um, attend virtually. Have you seen more people actually turn to faith? Well, I have. And again, you know, with the fires, as other people have mentioned, you know, we we were, we jumped right on it and we started reaching out to people who we knew who had been impacted. And so the community has stepped up to try and take care of people, right? And so that's what makes people want to connect. Um, so yeah, I've definitely seen some increase. Some people have fallen away, but the last thing I'll say is that both for the high holidays in the fall and this holiday where you send gifts to each other, we've delivered baskets to people who haven't been able to get out of their homes, elder folks or people who have some kind of immune compromised situation. And that just happened this week and it was pretty much all volunteers. So people are feeling that connection even when they're not able to be in person. That's really wonderful. Um, so I think we can now move on to the um, the panel discussion part of our, 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 our um, little event. We'll have to keep it a little bit shorter than anticipated. We thought we would do 20 minutes, but we'll do 10 so that we can also get the questions in at the end. Um, so uh, Mark, do you wanna start us off? Yeah, I think just sort of segueing <clears throat> off of what, you know, what Rabbi Paula was talking about um, with sort of bright sides and silver linings and sort of what Daisy was mentioning too with, you know, a rainy day coinciding with, uh, with a meeting that with parents and boom, right? There are things that are actually working within this. And, you know, I've been trying to sort of have those kind of conversations with other people too. I know that, you know, personally, you know, I've got a couple of teenagers that, you know, would probably be far less in this house. And I probably wouldn't have shared nearly as many meals with them as, as I have over the last year, had there not been a pandemic and, you know, for all the other, uh, you know, the other things that we can, we can quibble about uh, pro and con that's, that's pretty cool. So I would like to just throw it around, you know, more on the personal level for everybody. What, you know, name, name your kind of number one silver lining uh, over the last year. Let's start with Dr. G. Well, you know, I, uh, I've always been very concerned about the climate and I think that we've seen some real positive things here. I, I used to have to go to Sacramento on a regular basis for two hour meetings. It's a six hour drive for a two hour meeting. And now I don't have to do that. I can uh, just join. So I think that's huge. And I hope some parts of this stick. We, we still, we need to get back to normal, obviously. We need to be face to face, but uh, I think this has been a positive thing. People have kind of figured out that there maybe are other ways to, to get together. That's a good one. Absolutely. Yeah. Daisy? say that for me would be a family bonding time and also an opportunity to stretch myself with uh, knowing that I can learn anything. And prior to the pandemic, I would work out at a gym. Now during the pandemic, I've ventured out in these local trails and I hiked Half Dome, which is something that I, prior to the pandemic, I wouldn't have never imagined that I could do. I, I've also done several half marathons, walking half marathons. So I would say just these trails were always here, but I, I didn't, I would go to, I had my routine, I would go to the gym. And so now with the gym closing, I ventured out and I discovered these jewels that are here in my backyard. So I would definitely say bonding time with friends, family, and my connection with nature. Very cool. I think that family time is just, you know, the common thread. I think all of us are pretty grateful that we get to be with our families. 
Um, DNA, what about you? Uh, you're you're muted. I'm unmuted now, huh? Figured it out. <laughs> um, um, well, you know, when I said I did comedy for 14 years, I mean, being a comedian, I, I'm out. I was out five to seven nights a week till you know late. And my my wife and I we've been together 17 years. So for the last year. I mean, it's just, it's not, when's it going to end? <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. It's been, it's been so great. And, you know, we got a rescue dog uh, and uh, we love our dog and I love my wife. And it's, you know, it's just been, I mean, I don't know, you know, I want things to go back to the way they were, but they probably never were. And if this is the trade-off, I love this because I love being with my family. That's really wonderful. Sweet. Uh, Jenna Lee. See, I would say um, there's two silver linings for me. One is, well, so I have three little girls, a six, eight and 10 year old. And while it's really challenging having three kids home full time doing school, it's also been really incredible because, you know, when I get to have that time when I am there with them doing their schoolwork, I'm getting to play with them on their break. I'm getting to sit down on their lunchtime with them that I normally don't get. You know, when our kids are in school, they're gone that whole chunk of the day and you're off at work. And so when I am home and doing that school time with them, I'm really trying to be present and putting my work aside and setting that down. And I and I think that's been really incredible for me because I'm kind of a workaholic <laughs> in a sense. And, um, and so for me to get to say, this is, and I was saying this to Mark earlier, this, where are my feet at right now? This is where my feet are. My feet are with my kids and that's what my priority and my focus is. And so I've had so much more connection time with them and a really challenging time for small children on so many levels to not have their friends, to not be in school and, and just us that bond that we're getting to create on a deeper level that I already thought was pretty incredible. So that's been really special just, and, and the fact that they still like me and that's pretty cool. <laughs> they still like yeah. love me a lot. Um, you know, in this pandemic, they actually, uh, actually during the fires and we were evacuated from our home for 11 days and we we're going through a pandemic and all this stuff. And they actually, I thought like, okay, they've got to be over me soon. And they asked me to marry them. Like the three of them asked me to marry them and that we were always going to be together. And I said, I will 100% commit my life to you that I'm never going anywhere and I will always be with you. And so we all got like our own special wedding rings that we picked out together that we wear on our right hand, you know? So that was incredible to feel that. Um, I think another silver lining really quickly and then I'll let you guys move on is in a time of so much isolation, it can be really lonely and hard. But what I found in this is what a gift to have that time that we don't usually get to have for ourselves to go connect deeper and learn more about ourselves. And so I've gotten to connect with myself on such a deeper level and learn so much more and grow through this. And that has been really fantastic. And I'm really grateful for that through a pandemic and a really hard, challenging, isolating time. Absolutely. I mean, I love that story with your children. That's so, mm -hmm. so That's cute. Mm -hmm. it was really so special. Special. They picked out my ring and I helped them pick out theirs, but they picked both sides and it was really, really special. Do you, do you have it on? Can we see yeah, it? Yeah, I do. Yeah. This is a citrine. So this is a citrine stone and it is um, very like joy and abundance and happy and life. And so that was the stone and they all have ones that have little gemstones in them as well. There's are obviously much smaller little gemstones, but they have like moonstone and all different stuff. And so that was what they wanted. They wanted ones that had crystals because we are all about this like healing and the energy of it. And so they wanted ones that had gemstones because there's so much that it vibrates. So yeah. Very cool. That's, that's really great. Rabbi. A couple of things. One is the learning opportunities, the webinars that I'm able to get on um, with some of my colleagues and um, like, you know, learning from Ibram, Ibram Kendi, like that is like just how would that happen? Or this wonderful teacher in, in Seattle, Eric Ward, who's a social justice activist. You know, I've met him in person, but I wouldn't get to get on, you know, a couple times a month to hear what he's what he's sharing. 
we're seeing the inequities, as I mentioned earlier, um, more than we would have. And I, I really appreciate Dr. G, what you shared about what you've seen and, and how that's impacting people here. And again, you know, um, generally, I think it's connected to what you were saying too about resilience and um, trying to dig deeper inside to see what it is that you're able to bring forward at this time when we need it. Um, and DNA really like, I'm just gonna say, God bless you for keeping us laughing because we, we really need it. And so that's another piece of it. Um, there's a woman who's stuck in Florida with her 85 year old mother, Lisa Godoldig, um, and she did oh, yeah. out kosher comedy and she's doing comedy lockdown and I'm getting on, you know? So, and Daisy to take care of our teenagers, just incredible. So I'm just grateful for all of you who are stepping in and that's something that's come out during this pandemic too. And look out Santa Cruz, man, we have been waiting for you for a long time. Thank you. <laughs> did, we, did we pay you enough to say that Paula? <laughs> man, no, you can, I'm not gonna go into what's been lacking. That wouldn't be pretty. <laughs> Well, thank you. That is very, very kind. Much appreciated. Uh, and I mean, we are so happy to be here. Yeah. Uh, and I can, I can tell y'all. Uh, and sometimes I've been throwing in the y'all. I'm from, you know, I'm most recently moving from Texas, so it comes out sometimes. Um, moving during a pandemic was crazy, but my silver lining, just to round out this um, conversation. Uh, is that my family that lives across three different time zones uh, started making time to do a family Zoom call. And this is the whole extended family. We never did this before the pandemic. And somehow the pandemic has brought us closer across two different continents and three different, um, three different time zones. So I'm really grateful for that. Um, so unfortunately, we're, we've kind of run out of time. Well, we would have liked to have more of a conversation, but we do want to get some questions answered uh, with Dr. Gilarducci. Um, so thank you so much. And if you guys have any questions, please put them in uh, the Q&A and we'll try to get to them. Um, and Dr. Gilarducci, this is kind of going to be a lightning round so we can get as many questions as we can uh, fit in there. Okay. <laughs> yeah, he's, he's loosened up. Okay, yeah. awesome. Uh, get ready. So the first question is we kind of, hi, um, sorry, Jenna Lee's daughter. Um, oh. <laughs> they're so cute. <laughs> they're, they're really adorable. Um, so we, we kind of had a little bit of a rocky start with the vaccine when it first, you know, the first allotments started coming in. Um, and now we're seventh in the state. Uh, what changed? Yeah. Well, uh, it just a lot of hard work on, a, on the part of our health department. I think uh, they really deserve the lion's share of credit. It's not vaccine supply that's um, helped. We, we need a lot more. That's been our rate limiting step. But, you know, I, I, I was uh, just saying earlier today to somebody, uh, you know, some people have been dissatisfied with the vaccine rollout, as, I, as have I. Uh, but, you know, we have a patchwork healthcare system. So why would we expect a vaccine rollout to be any different? Um, it's been tough. Uh, and uh, I know it's getting better. And uh, I, I'm really encouraged that people are anxious to get vaccinated. I think that is the most promising sign of all of this. So, um, you know, more to come. I think the vaccine supply is um, going to improve a lot uh, soon. Um, I just heard that um, the state is probably going to get 380,000 doses of the um, Johnson & Johnson vaccine if it's approved by FDA tomorrow. Um, that we'll, we'll probably get that many doses coming in the next few weeks. That'll really add to our supply. And remember, 380,000 uh, Johnson & Johnson vaccine doses is the same as double the number of Pfizer or Moderna because it's a single dose uh, vaccination. So that's really encouraging. So um, uh, anyway. Uh, what, what, while you're uh, on been, Johnson & you know, Johnson, uh, Dr. G, what, what, are your, what do you know? Um, what have you heard? What are your early, early thoughts on at, at how that compares to the others uh, yeah. wise and, and whatnot? Yeah, great question. In fact, uh, um, I was just asked this uh, on a news piece tonight. Um, so, you know, you may have heard the 66% effectiveness number for Johnson & Johnson versus the 95 or 94% for Pfizer and Moderna, respectively. And I think uh, we really have to be cautious in interpreting those numbers as uh, direct comparisons. There's lots of reasons why um, you can't really do that. Uh, number one reason was these 
these vaccines were tested at different times during the pandemic. And by the time the Johnson & Johnson was tested, um, it was uh, later in the pandemic, and we had some variants out there that seemed to show some vaccine resistance. So that's number one. Number two, they were, they were um, you know, done on different populations in different countries. And then the, the last reason is that um, the outcomes of each of these trials were slightly different. But what's important, I think, about all three of these vaccines is they have shown to be 100%. I mean, this is amazing to me. 100% effective in keeping you out of the hospital. So that means keeping you from being sick and not one person in these trials, all three of these trials, not one person that's been vaccinated died from COVID. And that's not true for the people that got placebo. So to me, that is tremendous news and really do not think of one vaccine as somehow better or inferior to another. That's uh, that's really good to know, especially yeah. you know for people who have a lot of um, anxiety about this. You know, it was yeah. very short clinical trials, so that makes sense. Um, so we've we've gotten a lot of questions about this. Um, earlier this week, uh, the county expanded eligibility for the vaccine to certain occupational groups. Uh, so we have our teachers, childcare workers, first responders. Mm -hmm. um, and food and agricultural workers. Mm -hmm. A lot of people want to know, um, what about food service workers, grocery store and retail yeah. workers, people who are really have been on the front lines and yeah. haven't had a chance to try and, you know, w stay home. They, they don't necessarily, they can't necessarily stay home. So right. what right. about them? Yeah, and absolutely essential, aren't they, as well? Yeah, uh, you described uh, the three occupational groups or tiers um, in uh, what we call phase 1B, tier 1. Uh, and, um, and that does include uh, food and ag. So it would include a lot of the groups that you just mentioned. So they're all eligible at this point in Santa Cruz County. We're still doing a rollout, and we expect by uh, next week we'll be able to formally um, roll that out. Now, you may have seen that teachers and police officers uh, have been able to get vaccinated. That is through a kind of independent means, and we certainly support that. But uh, from the county health, uh, public health perspective, we felt that we really needed to saturate um, those most at risk of dying from the disease first. And so we've targeted our older individuals as well as uh, for certain zip codes that have um, um, health and social indicators that put them more at risk. So trying to do that equity piece along with the uh, age piece. Yeah. It Dr. G. goes back to one of those tough questions or tough decisions you all have had to make. Absolutely, right. Sorry, go ahead, Mark. Indeed, yeah. Um, so, you know, we've recently reported about, uh, you know, the UCSC starting to um, start to test for COVID in the county here. And, and yeah. um, you know, we've already had had cases right over the hill. I think the UK variant was found over in Santa Clara mm -hmm. County. You know, have have any cases? You know, I know it's it's it, we're probably still just getting returns back, but you know, what what are your you know have we had any cases of COVID variants been found here? And and if not yet, is your anticipation that we will? We we don't know yet in Santa Cruz County. Uh, I hope to know by Saturday afternoon. <laughs> Uh, because that's when uh, we expect the first results of whole genome sequencing to be available. Um, but I have not heard of any cases in Santa Cruz County. Um, but to answer the second part of your question, yes, I do expect these to be uh, widespread. In fact, um, even the California Department of Public Health has uh, predicted by the, by the end of the March, um, the UK variant will be the predominant variant in California. So we know that. And what does that mean? Uh, right now, what it means is that um, this virus has found a way to be more efficient in how it transfers from person to person. So uh, it, uh, and viruses do this. In fact, RNA viruses are sort of notorious for this. Um, and so um, uh, this one, uh, you know, there's enough virus out there where there's more opportunities for mutations to find a kind of, um, you know, serendipitous, serendipitous advantage and able to, to exploit uh, our immune system and our, um, our biology, and so this is one uh, example of that. We we don't know for sure whether this virus is going to be uh, more deadly on a per infection basis, but we do know that it will be more deadly because it could cause more infections. 
But again, I'm, I'm really hopeful because um, we have really good penetration of our older folks in terms of vaccination. I was just looking at our numbers today. We're over 70% of our 75 and older group. We're um, around the 60% uh, every, uh, people have gotten first um, shots in the 65 and older group. So we're making great progress. And I expect, um, you know, somebody put in the chat today that somebody was, uh, their 71 year old husband was able to get a shot today. And we just need more and more of that to happen. Um, so that's gonna protect our healthcare system. We won't get to that situation that uh, Tulsi asked me about uh, earlier, you know, a couple of months ago when we were really on the edge there. Um, I, I feel helpful for that. That's really good to know um, that, you know, we're, we're headed in the right direction. Yes. Um, so on that same note, um, you know, some, some doctors have suggested that we could achieve herd immunity by April. Uh, what are your thoughts on that? Especially with the uh, vaccine rollout pace that we're at right now. Yeah, I think that's gonna be tough. Uh, some of the numbers I've read is around 80% of the population would have to be vaccinated to reduce that pool of, of virus enough where um, regular interactions are less likely to result in infection. There's, I think, also another school of thought that we may never actually reach herd immunity. This may be like flu, and that might mean that we get a shot every year for COVID. Um, uh, one of the things that we do know is clear is that um, while the United States um, may uh, be vaccinated uh, early uh, with respect to the rest of the world, until we're able to control this worldwide, we're going to continue to have this, this disease with us. So. I think uh, it's time to think about how to live with this. And it doesn't mean like the shutdowns and, and the severe restrictions on our businesses that we've had, uh, but we're gonna have to learn how to live with this. And I think that going forward, um, I mean, one of the things that's really remarkable is we've had almost no flu this year. And that doesn't mean that the flu virus doesn't exist anymore. It just means that we've kind of learned how to not spread disease to each other. And I wish we had universal sick leave policies in this country where people didn't feel that they were obligated to go to work if they were sick. We need to change the culture about, um, I, I was just dealing with a, a critical business here in the county and there was one individual who came in sick with a cough and he just didn't wanna let the rest of his team members down um, thinking I, I can't call in sick, but you know, now there's an outbreak in that, in that site. And so it was well-meaning, but you know, that kind of thinking, we have to really rethink that going forward. I've got a two-part question for you, Dr. G. How long do you think we will be wearing masks in general? And have you had a chance to speak with or comment uh, to our, our uh, anti-masking friends who have been popping up around here? Uh, I'm glad you asked about the anti-masking. In fact, I think I saw Wallace uh, Bain's name on this. I want to shout out to him because he wrote uh, an editorial the other day that was just spot on about um, this idea of anti-masking. Um, I mean, what we need to come together as a country. That's the way I look at this. And I think Santa Cruz County, by the way, is exceptional in that way. Uh, we've seen very little of this in this county um, that we've, you know, you've seen in other places. This isn't about politics. It's not about government control. It's about respecting one another. And, um, and to see people of privilege who go in and try to uh, exploit this situation and try to, you know, get attention for themselves, I just find, I just find that really disgusting, to be honest. And so, uh, if you have a chance to read Wallace's piece uh, recently, I, I recommend that to you. But uh, as far as when we're going to, you know, how long are we going to be wearing masks? That's a great question. Um, I think that, um, you know, until we have uh, uh, most of our population vaccinated, I think we're going to have to live with that. And I think going forward, we need to think about masks uh, as part of our, our lives um, when, you um, you know, uh, maybe in some uh, settings where you have a little bit of a runny nose, maybe it's time for you to pop on a mask. And hopefully that's not going to be um, a kind of weird thing going forward. I think other countries have sort of learned this. Yeah, I think I've, I've definitely seen it um, in Asia. You know, when I when I go back home, I've seen it in India. I've seen it in yeah. uh, East Asian countries, too. So 
that um, that might be something that we adopt. Who knows? Um, so ethicists suggest that if you're offered the vaccine, you should take it. What are your thoughts? Uh, absolutely. <laughs> I'm a very strong proponent of vaccines. There's a lot of misinformation about vaccines in general and in the COVID vaccines in particular. And so uh, I think it's, um, you know, I, I think my most common message to people is uh, do not rely on social media for your information. You need to go to reputable, reputable sources like Lookout Santa Cruz, uh, look at sources like, um, you know, um, uh, I won't name myself, but, you know, uh, public health officials, your physicians and so forth to get the real information. Uh, people, I think uh, something about human, uh, human nature tries to exploit uh, people's anxieties and use that to their advantage. And, and I, I do think that a lot of us have been manipulated that way. Um, DNA mentioned um, uh, the uh, uh, QAnon, I think is just, uh, just another example. That's another sort of viral infection, if you will. Absolutely. What's been the biggest uh, vaccine misinformation you've heard so far? And do you want to set that record straight? Well, since I mentioned DNA, sorry, I keep picking on you. <laughs> but uh, one myth out there is that somehow the mRNA vaccines actually alter your DNA, which is not the case at all. And uh, uh, there, there are some other um, concerns, especially in the Latino community, about um, uh, potential for sterility, um, there's some, um, some issues about uh, fetal cells somehow being involved in the manufacture. Uh, and, uh, and so some people had some ethical questions about that. And we have not, I mean, uh, we're trying to dispel those myths as we, as we go, but, um, but those are just one of, or just a few of many, I should say. Yeah. Dr. G, we're gonna wrap up with one last one from um, someone uh, in our audience, Naomi Beyer uh, is asking, what is your feeling about asymptomatic uh, vaccinated persons potentially infecting a non-vaccinated person? Well, I, you know, I think it's very likely that the vaccine will prevent you from passing the disease on to others. The problem is we just don't have enough experience yet to know that. So out of an abundance of caution, we're recommending that vaccinated people continue to take the same precautions they're taking now uh, we think that we'll be able to relax some of those precautions when you're interacting with other vaccinated people. And even right now, a vaccinated person who might be exposed to somebody who's positive for COVID doesn't need to quarantine like they used to. Um, but um, but I, I think we'll see continuing guidance coming out on that. Great, great. Well, I just, uh, I just wanna say thank you all so very much for joining us. Um, everyone's stories were super inspiring um, and we're really grateful that you came in to share them with us. Um, and so now just a few programming notes at the very end. Um, for everybody who uh, joined us today, thank you so much. Those of you who are Lookout members, thank you for supporting us and if anybody um, wants to consider becoming a member, um, you will be receiving, because you attended this event, you will be receiving tomorrow an email, which will have some uh, information about this event, resources that our uh, panelists are, have shared, um, a video recap of this, so you can come back and watch it, um, and you will have uh, a discount code um, to become a Lookout member. So thank you so much for joining us. Um, I do have a couple, um, uh, I, do, I do want to finish off by, uh, by saying thank you obviously to our panelists um, and then also our media partners. Uh, thank you Digital Nest, Miller Maxfield, Visit Santa Cruz County, Santa Cruz County Bank, Altera Solar, Paro Valley Chamber of Commerce and Agriculture, Choose Santa Cruz, Think Local First, KND Landscaping, Santa Cruz County Chamber of Commerce, Santa Cruz County Business Council, Capitola Soquel Chamber of Commerce, the Monterey Bay Economic Partnership, and uh, last but not least, uh, Event Santa Cruz and Matthew Swinnerton, who has been just a fantastic partner and has joined us on every single one of our Lookout events. 
Um, so for those of you who, uh, who are coming back to a Lookout event, thank you for coming back. And for those of you who joined us for the first time today, welcome, and we hope to see you again. Have a great night, everybody. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. I was with